apologize in advance if I have to call during this. I don't know under the weather. Long time attendee, first time speaker. I'm Heather. I'm the director for the Scholarly Journals at the American Diabetes Association. I'm going to take you through a basic overview of ADA's use case for hypothesis annotations. Uh, ADA publishes four scholarly journals covering every aspect of diabetes research and care from basic research uh, to clinical and translational research. ADA's clinical research journal, Diabetes Care, publishes annual practice, clinical practice guidelines and a supplemental issue to the journal called the Standards of Medical Care and Diabetes. It's a comprehensive resource of all aspects of care for treating patients with diabetes. The Standards of Care Supplement is funded by ADA's general revenue. It doesn't receive industry support, and its contents are reviewed and approved by ADA's Professional Practice Committee. The Professional Practice Committee is a multidisciplinary expert committee comprised of physicians, diabetes educators, registered dietitians, and others who have expertise in a range of diabetes care. An estimated 30.0 million people of all ages, or 9% of the entire U.S. population, had diabetes in 2015, with 1.5 million new cases in that year alone. There is an equally staggering amount of information about diabetes continually being added online. The field of diabetes research and care changes so quickly, and new research is published daily, probably even an hour later. ADA has been publishing clinical practice guidelines for 28 years. And to put this in perspective, the first collection of guidelines published by ADA in 1989 was four pages inside of an issue of diabetes care. And today, the standards of care is well over 170 pages. It's also known as the most defend as the de definitive source for credible diabetes care clinical practice recommendations. As such, ADA wanted to be able to include new information as evidence becomes available. For instance, if a new diabetes drug is approved by the FDA, which actually just happened this last winter. The 2018 standards of care went live on December 5th of 2017, and the FDA approved two new diabetes drugs only two weeks later. So with our traditional model, we wouldn't have been able to include the new drugs in our recommendations until we published the next updated version an entire year later. We could publish errata and update the online version, but these types of additions aren't errors. And we want to stay away from having multiple versions of expert recommendations. ADA's Chief Scientific Medical and Mission Officer and the former Editor-in-Chief of Diabetes Care, Dr. William Sepulup, said this is unacceptable. And he challenged us to find a way to share the most important updates more frequently than traditional publishing models would allow to create a kind of living document. Very legible there. So to that end, beginning with the 2018 Standards of Medical Care, ADA began including this type of information in the form of annotations directly to the version, directly to the version of record using hypothesis installed on our iWire site. For those not familiar with hypothesis yet, the readers of the online version see highlighted, um, see text highlighted in yellow, and clicking on it opens the annotation pane to the right, and it's an ADA branded annotation pane. And then, as each annotation is viewed, the corresponding text turns from yellow to blue. So each ADA annotation contains the official update, the rationale for making the change any corresponding references, the professional practice committee approval date, a publication date, a suggested citation, and options for sharing. There's also a button for downloading uh, <coughs> the beloved PDF containing the annotations, and users can create private notes. <coughs> the drop-down box at the top of the annotation pane links out to a running list of ADA annotations. Here, users see a short publisher profile. It's very short. It's shorter than a tweet, because that's a unit of measure now. <laughs> Here, users can access
access the annotations in context through links, search annotations using tags, and create private groups for discussion. The process for updating the standards of medical care with annotations is, is pretty straightforward. ADA currently receives requests for updates through the ADA professional website from readers, professional members, staff, board members, really anyone, through a web form. These requests are received and researched by ADA's scientific and medical staff, and it's determined whether an immediate update is warranted. The language is then drafted and presented to the Professional Practice Committee. The committee reviews the proposed change, requests any necessary edits, and then those receiving greater than 50% of majority vote among the group are sent to ADA publication staff for inclusion in the standards in the form of annotations. <laughs> the process for adding the annotation is simple. We log in with our publisher credentials, highlight the text, select the annotate button, and add the information. Super simple. ADA's communications department simultaneously issues a press release and social media posts describing the update, and ADA's professional members and journal subscribers receive an email. The annotations are then compiled and published in the journal under the title Updates to the Standards of Medical Care. When the annual supplement, supplement is published again, it will include the updates relayed throughout the year as annotations. So when ADA publishes annotations, all of the additional standards of care materials have to be updated to reflect the latest evidence. This includes things like a free slide deck, a point of care app, professional education programs, and countless other materials, including those for consumers. So it's a lot of concerted effort across the association, um, and we're, we're definitely going to reserve annotations for the most important information for that reason. There are some important points to note. This is not a perfect solution for ADA's very specific use case, in fact. ADA takes on a huge responsibility when publishing information used to treat patients. And as I mentioned, the guidelines and the standards have been researched and vetted by experts in the various fields of diabetes. like ADA is a nonprofit with a mission, uh, which is to bring annotations to all content on the web. Viewers of the standards of care may therefore sign up or log in the hypothesis and add annotations on a public layer that's viewable to others who sign up for or log in the hypothesis. So ideally, ADA wouldn't have public annotations on, uh, alongside guideline content. But there isn't a way to hide sign up or sorry, the sign up or log in links on publishers selected issues or articles, in, including those, of course, containing the official EDA recommendation. So there's also no way to verify the identities, let alone the qualifications of public annotators, uh, or to moderate annotations added by the public to the public layer. Although there is the ability to flag annotations for hypothesis moderators to review and remove. So this, this poses an obvious challenge for EDA public annotators could have a vested interest in a diabetes-related product or contribute potentially false or dangerous information. I'd like to think that our readership would understand the difference between uh, a public annotation and an official ADA recommendation, but is that good enough? I, I really don't know. ADA therefore needs to closely monitor public annotations on the standards of care in order to provide timely responses and flag any uh, annotations in violation of community standards so that hypothesis can remove them. On a positive note and highly noteworthy, the, annotation, or the annotated standards of care has received a very large boost in traffic. Access to the standards has in fact more than doubled when comparing the traffic over the same seven month period of the previous year in, in usage reports. We went from almost 500,000 total accesses in 2017 to 1,370,000 total accesses as of the last data pool. So publishing annotations throughout the year gives ADA many more opportunities to promote the standards of care. 
to create awareness, and it, and it seems to pay off. So even so, uh, we have not actually received public comments to date. The standards of care updates are ADA's primary use case for hypothesis annotations. But we are looking at other ways we might incorporate the functionality. For example, we could create private groups for the professional practice committee or other groups to discuss and comment on content we publish um, or on parts of our website. Or we could create a private group for publication staff members to collaborate on items like instructions for authors, uh, for example. But who knows, we might embark on a, a campaign to annotate diabetes misinformation all over the web. There's plenty of it out there. <laughs> We're still looking at different ways we might incorporate the functionality. As so well said by Dr. Sefalu, this initiative represents a paradigm shift that directly reflects ADA's mission to improve the lives of all people living with diabetes. You can read more about Dr. Sefalu's uh, living standards in an editorial the citations provided. And that's it. Thank you. So uh, we have some time for uh, some questions. Uh, also, I think uh, any other uh, general uh, observations you have about this kind of approach uh, to take and working with the publishing problem. Did we get to a uh, mic down to Richard? Um, uh, just while we're doing that, let me just comment that uh, one of you uh, made a suggestion a few weeks ago uh, that uh, another uh, publishing problem that might be solvable with this kind of annotation uh, is the, the problem of uh, disputed figures. Uh, if, say, you have an article from five years ago and a controversy arises over a particular figure, well, rather than publishing a, a retraction, a correction, something like that, uh, you could annotate the, the figure uh, with the, the challenge and the author's response. Uh, that seemed to be a, another example of a, a way of addressing a publishing editorial problem. Richard? Um, so my question is, um, how much do users search this resource? And how is that affected by the fact that presumably the high wire driven source search, it does not search annotations because they're not content? It's a really good point. And I, it's, it's an issue. Like we need to know, we need statistics on who's accessing these and how many how, how often it's being accessed and by who. But I, I don't think there's currently a way to track that. But I mean, I, I just wanted to put something, certainly with some different resources, you can say, oh, this is, this is a resource that lots of people, even before we introduced annotation, were searching, or this is a resource that people tend to kind of like browse to find a particular thing. Because if most people are going to something, um, then it doesn't matter too much. But if they're actually thinking that they might be able to search on the basis of stuff that was in annotations, mm -hmm. then that's going to be Well, if you, um, if you visit the, the hypothesis page that, um, that has the running list of all the annotations, they link out to the, to the actual pages in context, but you can search through them there. But you're saying if there's a new drug that came out, not searching for that drug on high wire, it's not going to pick up the annotation where the new drug is announced. But, but it will pick up, whoops, the, um, the paper. Sorry. It's, um, it, that, that search would pick up the, uh, the paper that we publish, the updates to the standards of medical care and diabetes. This explains the <laughs> annotation and would be found in any sort of content search. Right, but so, so, I'm, so I'm, maybe I'm, but so if there was, but if you had an annotation that mentioned, I don't know, epinephrine, mm -hmm. and epinephrine was not in the main content, and then somebody comes to high wire and says, I want to see if there's any mention of epinephrine in this, and that only appears in the annotation, then they'll get zero on their search results, right? But any time we publish an annotation online, we'll also publish it in an article, so it's, uh, okay. so it's discoverable okay. Okay. through right. search.
we have uh, talked with Hypothesis about ways of engineering uh, true search. Uh, it's complicated. Uh, if there certainly are, you know, if there are enough use cases where that becomes a requirement, then we certainly look at it. On this slide, the update, review, and approve. Can you describe that process a little bit more? I guess I'm concerned about, I imagine that ADA and other associations have a very involved committee process for mm -hmm. reviewing and creating and there's systematic reviews and timelines along those lines. Can you describe to me the, how a hypothesis comment is updated? these requests for changes to the standards of care through a web form on the professional membership website. So when that um, email comes in, the, it's received by the scientific and medical staff. They review it and make sure it's valid. Um, they do some research on it on their own. They, uh, let's see, they, they draft, and then they draft language if they decide this is a valid request. And then they present it to the professional practice committee who meets regularly. The committee then reviews the proposed change, requests any necessary edits, sometimes this process goes back and forth. There's a lot of um, discussion that happens in person and over email. Um, and then in the end, the group comes together and takes a vote on whether or not um, the change will be made. And that actually, that happens for all changes in the standards of care, but at that point, we also decide if this is something that we need to immediately address in the form of an annotation. Are there more than one guideline, or is it just standards of medical care and diabetes? Is it just one? That's just one supplement that contains several articles focused on the various aspects of care. Rich? I'm wondering if you have a lot of stuff. Like Turn the mic on. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if you have a lot of freely available content where you're worried about the public making erroneous comments. Um, and John's comment made me remember somebody who was going by the name of Claire Francis a few years ago. Um, I could see somebody like that coming in and putting comments all over the place that you have to deal with. Is that a yeah. problem at all, or do you have a no, um so we haven't actually received any public comments to date, but getting back to your comment about being free, this entire supplement is free. It, it's open access, it's, we, we want it to be as widely used as possible. Like, it just, it, it's a mission driven publication. So you haven't had people who believe in alternative medicine or something coming in and saying, mm -hmm. this is all bogus, you should be eating this supplements is why we, Yeah, we, this is why it's, it's probably not a perfect solution for ADA because we have to monitor so closely to address anything like that. But like I said, we haven't had the issue yet. Great. Thanks. Any other? <coughs> Guys, I just wanted to um, add a couple things uh, to, to Heather's remarks, which um, were, it was wonderful to hear. In terms of um, discovery for the hypothesis um, public channel, annotations um, on something that has a DOI or that include a link to something that has a DOI are sent to Crossref event data for indexing through Google. So with these um, publisher layers, if the publisher would like those um, publicly visible annotations to be sent to Crossref for indexing via Google and, and search, we can, we can definitely do that. Um, so you said the public comments, sorry, could also the publisher comments, we could do that? Yeah. yeah, we wouldn't do it without your permission. Um, and then uh, Heather mentioned watching over the, <clears throat> the annotations that are made in the public channel. So there's a number of like really easy ways that you can do that you can set up um, for, for anything made, any annotations made on your content to come into to Slack or other messaging tools um, that you might use. Um, if you do have um, a use case that allows um, anyone to participate, those um, populate to the group page so you can see them in real time there and you can, you can keep close eye on them. So, um, you know, fortunately, uh, we haven't had any any problems, but with the wider awareness of the annotations, you know, that's something that we do expect to happen. Um, we have a team that keeps a close eye on that, 
and then we're also looking you know, for future to uh, either sentiment analysis in the annotations themselves or, or perhaps um, looking at user behavior uh, to try to make determination, you know, try to filter out some of the bad actors. One of the um, things that we're going to be implementing for, for BioArchive and, and for the Wiley uh, AGU uh, preprint server ESOR is the ability to require someone to have an ORCID and authenticate with an ORCID before they can make annotations into the group. So it's just another layer, and when we have that, if that's something that um, you know, ADA or someone else is interested in, you know, just let me know. That's great. We can talk more about that for sure. Thanks, Heather. Mm -hmm. uh, any other comments or questions? <coughs> great. Thanks, Heather. Thank you.